Great, thank you so much. And thank you to the organizers. Um, this is an incredible week of virtual events in cancer research in immuno-oncology, and I am very happy to be a part of it. Um, and so I will be talking uh, to you today a little bit about my research in neuroscience and oncology. Um, the title of my talk is When Good Things Go Off Track, which is not a typo. Um, we'll be talking about the intersection of neurodevelopment and oncology. And it should be no surprise to anyone attending this lecture series that neurodevelopment is a very finely tuned and well orchestrated series of events, starting um, with just a couple of cells moving on through formation of the neural tube um, up through later fetal development. And what is surprising to a lot of people is that neurodevelopment is incomplete um, until early adulthood. And this corresponds with linear increases in white matter, as well as nonlinear increases in gray matter. And here you can see some of the ages in postnatal weeks, as well as um, postnatal uh, years as well, or sorry, postconception and postnatal years, um, where you have different waves of synaptic pruning, myelination, changes in um, synaptogenesis, gliogenesis, and obviously uh, migration of neurons throughout the brain. Uh, there is also regional maturity um, as the brain develops as well, with sort of the sensory motor cortex um, maturing prior to the prefrontal areas, which are important for more executive control and cognitive functioning. And what you see here is just a time-lapse video, um, scans of 13 healthy children uh, between the ages of four and 21, scanned every two years, um, and it's put together using cortical landmarks and statistical modeling of gray matter dens density. And what you can appreciate is that these prefrontal areas um, really are changing and among the last to mature um, until about 21 years of age. And as a neuroscientist, which is how I was trained, um, we have a lot of really amazing tools to go in and look at neurodevelopment. So here you can see an image of um, some images or some pictures of um, retrograde tracers. So you can actually inject dye into the brains of mice and go in and image them, um, looking at the really fine tuned um, sort of dendritic branches um, of, of the nervous system. And with so many areas uh, to sort of misstep, it's actually amazing that all of us um, turn out as well as we do. And this is in large part to a family of receptors known as the neurotrophin receptors, um, of which there are three, track A, track B, and track C. Um, and these are encoded by the genes N track one, N track two, and N track three, respectively. And they have very important roles in neural development are, and are important for sort of maintaining this plasticity of the nervous system, um, not only during development, but also through throughout life. Um, and what you can see here is that each of the neurotrophin receptors um, bind different ligands with varying affinity. Um, and the one that we'll be spending most of the time on today is track B. And track B, as it's known, um, has primary roles in neurodevelopment, neuron survival, um, certainly differentiation and neurite outgrowth and major influences um, throughout neuroscience, uh, particularly in calcium signaling and LTP or long-term potentiation, um, which is how we all learn and remember things. And even the slightest aberrations in track B levels or uh, its ligand brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF depicted here, have been associated with a wide range of um, disorders, uh, neurological disorders, psychiatric disorders, um, as well as different cancers. And while the nervous or neuroscientists um, have been studying these track receptors for quite some time, um, they also are very widely studied in the field of oncology. And this is a surprise to many neuroscientists, just as um, it is a surprise to many oncologists uh, that these neurotrophins are so well known in the neuroscience community. Um, the first uh, track receptor was actually identified as a fusion, um, track A, to TPM3 in human colorectal carcinoma. And what you can see here is a really nice um, sort of diagram explaining um, the different discoveries or sort of monumental discoveries of the track receptors and their roles in oncology. 
Um, there are tons of papers in the literature these days identifying different track fusions. Um, I mentioned the first of which is NTRAC1 and TPM3, um, but these track fusions have been identified in a wide range of adult and pediatric cancers. And typically what you have here um, is a fusion between one of the track receptors and uh, encoded by NTRAC1, 2, or 3 with some five prime upstream uh, gene partner. And this is just a diagram showing some of the more common cancers um, harboring track fusions. But if you go on PubMed, there's almost, it seems like a new one every single day. In addition to um, these tracks being found, uh, you know, fused to other genes, as I just showed on the previous slide, tracks exhibit very complex splicing patterns um, and differences in their post-translational modification. And what you can see here on the left are just some of the variants or the splice variants of human track A compared with um, human track B. And these figures are somewhat out of date. Uh, we do know that there are even more splice variants of both of these receptors um, currently. And so my lab sort of ties together some of the earlier work I did in developmental neuroscience um, with this sort of track signaling. Um, and we incorporate how alternative splicing and the primary roles of development um, can influence oncogenesis. And I'll be highlighting one alternatively spliced receptor variant uh, known as track BT1. So this is an isoform of the track B receptor encoded by NTRAC2. And as I mentioned, all of the tracks have been implicated in a wide range of um, various psychiatric, neurological disorders, as well as various cancers. Um, and what you see here is sort of the full length track B receptor. So what everyone thinks of is almost the Cinderella of the, the neuroscience field. Um, it has an intracellular kinase domain um, upon dimerization, ligand binding dimerization. It elicits several different downstream signaling pathways. Um, and this kinase domain is encoded here, um, represented by exons 20 to 24 in this diagram. There is also um, a truncated variant of this track B receptor, among others, um, where this kinase domain is actually lacking. And what you can see here is that there is an 11 amino acid intracellular domain um, encoded here uh, in this diagram by exon 16. And for the longest time, um, it was sort of thought to be a dominant negative. It was soaking up extra BDNF, um, prohibiting the full length track B from doing, uh, doing its thing. Um, but we now know that track B T1 does have several functions of its own. Um, and we were curious as to what its role in oncology may be, um, specifically in brain tumors. So the main focus of the next uh, few slides will be investigating the role of track BT1 in brain tumor biology. And the first thing that we did when we asked this question, um, we wanted to compare the levels of the full length track B receptor to its sort of um, truncated track BT1 uh, partner. Um, and what you can see on the left here are samples from the Cancer Genome Atlas. So uh, glioblastoma is in purple, low-grade gliomas are in this sort of orange mustard color. Normal brain is shown here on the right. And what you can see on this PCA plot is that the tumors separate and are distinct from the normal brain samples, which is what you would expect. Um, but when we actually go in and ask the question, which splice variant is the more predominant splice variant in these samples, um, you can see that the majority of the tumor samples um, show track BT1 as their predominant isoform compared to the full length variant, whereas in the normal brain, there's more of a mix with a lot of full length track B. If we then look at this um, across box plots, you can see that the levels of full length track B and track BT1 in normal brain are relatively equal, whereas the low grade gliomas or glioblastomas in the brain tumors, um, the track BT1 levels are significantly higher than the full length. This is also true for um, about 50 different human glioma stem cell lines as well. And the next question that we you know, wanted to ask is, okay, we see that the levels are higher, but what does it look like? Where 
is the track BT1 um, distributed and localized in these different brain tumors? And so um, I was fortunate to be working at Fred Hutch in Seattle at that time. Um, and we actually developed our own antibody um, by using track BT1 knockout mice and boosting them with a peptide um, against the 11 amino acid uh, intracellular region that was knocked out. Um, and the reason we did that is because this intracellular 11 amino acid tail is 100% conserved across species. So um, if we tried to use different mice, rabbits, um, even the Armenian hamster, the sequence was the same. And so using these knockout mice worked really well for us. Um, and we were able to generate a monoclonal antibody that recognizes um, track BT1 specifically um, compared to uh, the full length variant. There are many great commercially available antibodies, but they're designed against the extracellular domain, which you can see is actually shared um, among the two receptors. And so here you can see um, this antibody used on different human um, brain tumors as well as normal human brain um, on the top and then on mouse brain tumors and um, normal mouse brain in the bottom. And one thing that you can notice right away, um, we have this a little bit zoomed in, is that in the normal human brain, track BT1 tends to be localized in these really tight sort of vesicles or this, this punctate pattern. Whereas when we look at the human glioblastoma, um, we see that it is sort of strongly diffuse everywhere. That nice organization that we see in the normal brain um, is lost and we see strong diffuse staining throughout the brain tumors. So this, you know, sort of clued us in that track BT1 may be important um, for brain tumor biology, but could we really get it um, to show that it was it was also causing tumors as well? And so to do this, um, we employed the RCAS TBA system, um, of which Eric Holland's lab is an expert in, also at Fred Hutch. Um, and RCAS is sort of um, short nomenclature for uh, replication competent avian sar avian like sarcoma virus um, basically what you need to know for the purposes of this talk is that it is an avian virus or a bird virus um, and we can clone in any gene of in interest typically an oncogene we can also knock out tumor suppressors um, and you may think well that's interesting um, you're working with mice but you're using an avian virus and what we do is actually take our virus and infect DF1 cells in vitro, which are um, chicken fibroblasts. And we do this because the RCAS virus will only infect cells that carry a TBA receptor. And so um, by doing this, it allows us to uh, deliver our gene of interest to mice that are expressing the TVA receptor in very particular cell types. Uh, for the mice that I'll be talking about in this presentation, we used nesting TVA mice. So um, RCAS is only really targeting the neural and the glial progenitors of this, this uh, mouse line. And this allows us to then assess tumor formation in a fully immunocompetent mouse model. Um, and what you can see is that if we add um, track BT1 to a known oncogene, in this case for gliomas, we're using platelet derived growth factor B or PDGFB, we see that um, the mice actually die much earlier if co expressed with this track BT1 variant. We also then looked at various signaling pathways um, and we found that track BT1 actually enhances PDGF signaling and can upregulate genes in the PI3K and AKT signaling pathways um, using 3T3 cells. Uh, performing some RNA-seq on human neural stem cells over expressing um, track B full length or track BT1, we actually see similar patterns that um, there are increases in genes associated with PI3K, AKT um, signaling and cancer, as well as other AKT um, networks. And so what I hope you can appreciate just from those uh, slides is that track BT1 um, is not just a dominant negative, and it does have a role in uh, glioma. The uh, splice variant terminal exons um, are intact also um, in, 
and track two kinase fusion driven cancers, including various brain tumors, um, which we'll revisit at the end. Um, but for the most part, it is the predominant isoform found in human glioma. It has a really unique distribution pattern compared to normal brain, um, where it is mostly found sort of very tightly organized. Um, it's present highly in um, astrocytes. And that uh, track BT1 enhances um, gliomogenesis in vivo in our mouse model and upregulates genes associated with PI3K. Now, this was you know, very interesting to us and um, clued us in that, you know, track BT1 may have um, some roles uh, in oncology and certainly um, brain tumors specifically, but knowing what we know about normal neurodevelopment and how important all of these track receptors are, we were curious, you know, what the role is with track BT1 in normal development and certainly other cancers as well. And so shown here on the left um, is some immun immunohistochemistry of uh, mice from embryonic day 11 up through um, embryonic day 17, stain for the full length track B receptor. And what you can really nicely see, and you don't need to be a neuroscientist to appreciate, is that the brain and the spinal cord are stained um, very strongly compared to uh, other organs throughout development. If we then use the antibody that we made against track BT1 um, and stain embryos with that, um, we see that its expression is actually very different. Um, and this is not an artifact. At first, we thought maybe it was just being overstained for some reason. Um, but we realized pretty quickly that the levels in early development of track BT1 are actually quite, quite high throughout the entire developing mouse embryo. And we wanted to look at this um, in sort of a higher resolution. Um, you know, what are the, the level of these two different splice variants of the track B receptor um, across embryonic development? And to do that, we collaborated with um, Jay Shenduri's group um, and June Cao specifically, who published this absolutely amazing mouse organogenesis cell atlas, um, or MOCA, um, that contains gene expression from 61 different embryos across five developmental stages. So in total, they analyzed over 2 million um, mouse embryonic cells. And what you can see here in their beautiful paper is that these cells sort of tend to fall into 38 distinct clusters. And they published in their Nature paper sort of the um, whole gene analysis. But what we were curious about, um, knowing that we could take advantage of the fact that track B full length and track B T1 differ from the three prime ends, is where are the splice variants in these clusters? And how does um, you know alternative splicing across embryonic development change in these different um, patterns? And so we worked with a very talented bioinformatic expert, um, Sonali Aurora, uh, to sort of download and reprocess the data from all 2 million cells. Um, it was approximately 73,000 CPU hours. Um, so we were very fortunate um, to have uh, some funding and server time to run this. Um, and what you can appreciate really quickly is that if you look at the expression of track B full length shown in orange, it tends to be predominantly expressed where you would expect in uh, neural populations. So excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, sensory neurons. But if we look at the levels of track BT1 or the expression pattern of track BT1 across these embryonic clusters, we see that it's actually expressed in many, many areas. So um, again, similar to what we saw using our antibody and immunohistochemistry, track BT1 tends to be expressed in early embryonic development in a wide range of cell populations. Here you can see connective tissue progenitors, um, premature oligodendrocytes, radial glia, um, isthmic organizer cells, and so on. Um, we worked with Michael Zager at um, Fred Hodge to basically put this online. Um, so there is an online platform where you can go and actually pick particular cell types um, to look at the expression patterns of these two different uh, variants in cell uh, populations across um, embryonic development. Um, but what you can nicely take away from this is that um, track BT1 is expressed um, across the central nervous system uh, trajectory 
and hopefully these play, um, you can actually go in as well and look at this across developmental time. So how does the expression of track B full length and track B T1 change across developmental stage? Um, in the central nervous system. And this was really exciting from a neuroscience perspective, but from an oncology perspective, what was actually even more exciting to us is that if we look at the mesenchymal trajectory, so sort of outside the central nervous system now, we see that track BT1 is broadly expressed um, in a variety of cell populations across the mesenchymal trajectory, very much so compared to um, this full length receptor. And so we were curious um, if, you know, knowing what we know about uh, neurodevelopment and gliomas and now seeing that track BT1 is expressed quite highly across embryonic development, what happens if we overexpress track BT1 um, using that RCAS TVA system in other cell types, so other organs. And what you can see here um, pretty clearly is that when doing that in our mouse model, um, in combination with P10 loss, um, we see tumors all over the body. So um, shown here, lots of soft tissue tumors, um, sarcomas. We had about 43 different tumors um, enveloping the kidney. Um, you can see lots of lesions and then a mass here in the liver um, and uh, an enlarged spleen in mice that um, received track BT1 compared to mice that did not. Um, and that actually um, is a non-solid tumor, which we can get to on the, the next slide. But um, essentially what we found is that um, when overexpressing track BT1 in our RCAS TBA mice, um, we got tumors all over the body. Um, we validated this with some in vitro assays as well and saw that um, when overexpressing track BT1, we saw enhanced colony formation, which is an assay um, typically associated uh, with um, proliferation and uh, cancer cells compared to the full length track B. Um, here's just an example of some of the non-solid tumors um, that we were seeing. So the mice uh, overexpressing track BT1 had various lymphomas, leukemias, um, and so on. Um, and while this was really interesting to us that track BT1, you know, is highly expressed across mouse embryonic development, and we, you know, can sort of generate these tumors in our mice, of course, we wanted to ask the question, um, where is this in humans? And so um, we stained some tissue microarrays of about, about 150 different human tumors um, using our track BT1 antibody. And you can see that this variant is actually highly expressed in a wide range of um, cancers outside of the central nervous system. Um, right here is just an example of um, NTRAX2 expression, so track BT1 in teal, and then the full length track B isoform in orange, excuse me, um, across all of the cancers in the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, and I think it's pretty easy to take away from this that uh, the teal bars or the track BT1 levels are higher than the full length track B levels um, across a wide range of human tumors. This was also the case um, for pediatric tumors as well. Um, so um, predominantly clear cell carcinoma of the kidney, um, neuroblastoma, rhabdoid tumor, and Wilms tumors. Um, and I started out by telling you how important these track fusions are um, in, in cancer. And one of the things that we uh, noticed, thanks to um, a wonderful reviewer um, that asked us to look for this, is that if we look at tumors across the ca cancer genome atlas, so depicted here by their um, TCGA acronyms, um, we actually see that track BT1 uh, levels or expression of the track BT1 exon um, is predominantly expressed even in the case of tumors harboring NTRAC fusions. And so the key takeaway points here um, is, you know, not necessarily just about track BT1, although that's the isoform that we investigated and are currently following up with in the laboratory, um, but track BT1 is one of many different unique splice isoforms um, that has roles in neuroscience, oncology, and development. Um, and alternatively, splice forms of all of the tracks, so A, B, and C, 
are are numerous, but um, their exact expression, certainly in clinical samples, um, and their role in normal and abnormal development is not yet known. But I think as you know, we make advances in single cell sequencing and next generation sequencing, um, certainly spatial genomics, um, understanding the roles of these different splice variants uh, in the context of not only development, but certainly um, neurodevelopment and oncology will be critical um, as we try to search for new therapeutic targets. And so I would just like to thank um, the Holland Lab, certainly at Fred Hutch um, for the earlier, earlier work, um, Eric, Sonali, um, Nick were instrumental um, in getting that first uh, glioma paper published. Um, certainly Hamid, Keith, PJ, um, our funding sources uh, as well. Um, and then a big thank you to my current lab at uh, Seattle Children's and University of Washington School of Medicine. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free um, to reach out at any of uh, the emails listed below. And thank you so much for the time.